we will be starting with Leviticus tonight, and then we will go, <laughs> we'll go into Numbers. Now, this is funny because Numbers and Leviticus are probably the two most hated books of the Bible. Um, <laughs> people, uh, people do not like reading them. Uh, you know, they get in Genesis and they're all gung ho. I'm going to read through the Bible, right? Woohoo! And hey, it's about you know the beginning and some fun stories about a family that lived a long time ago. Then you get into Exodus and they're still pretty excited about it. You know, there's all these miracles happening in Egypt. Then you get about halfway through Exodus and then they're like, oh, okay. I'll just power through the rest of the book. You know, I'll get to the tabernacle. But then, then the they repeat the same information twice, and they d- uh, well, the next book's going to be better. So then they get into Leviticus with, like, a little bit weary, worn and stuff, and they get about halfway through there, and, like, does this go on for much longer? And then assuming that they ha- don't skip the next section and they get about halfway through numbers, uh, the action starts picking up again. And like, hey, this isn't so bad, but then it fools you because numbers keep throwing in a bunch of laws. Uh it throughout it, and there's a reason for that. We'll look at it tonight. Uh, and they get, ah, oh, but then you get to Deuteronomy. It's like, okay, this one's not as bad. And then they get to Joshua, when they're all excited again. So typically what people do is they kind of make it through Exodus, and then they just skip over to Joshua. <laughs> and so we're we're looking at the at the two uh, most ignored books of the Bible tonight. Um, so this is definitely going to be a fun one, right? <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, help us to always be learners of your word, always be students. Uh, that we would always be wanting to change, always wanting to learn and grow. And, uh, Lord, we thank you that we have uh, such a valuable uh, asset in our life as as your word. Uh, We love you. Amen. So Leviticus is the third book of the law, also the third third book of the Bible. Duh. (laughs) You guys are all saying, yeah, we know that. Uh, Chronologically speaking, it follows after Exodus. It just kind of continues what's going on at Mount Sinai. Um, Whereas in, in the Exodus, uh, in the book of Exodus, the 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 covenant was first being given, like the introductory stuff. In Leviticus, it gets more into the kind of the the in depth stuff on it. Um, it's not going to look so much about uh, about the uh, land allotment. That's going to be more Numbers and Joshua. It's not really going to look too much at the tabernacle. That was Exodus. Leviticus wants to focus more on the the priests, the offerings, and the general holiness outside of the tabernacle, and how that inter- all interacts. So it, it, it's got its own its own focus. And when you're reading through the books of the law, remember that each one of them has their own. Uh, they're not just pointless laws. They are organized in a, in a way, is what I'm getting at. Um, so um, they're still at Mount Sinai. They really don't do any going anywhere in this book. Uh, as I mentioned, this is probably the least read book of the Bible. Nobody, <laughs> nobody says I read Leviticus today f- on my day off. Like nobody says that. Um, as far as its name, it, it's kind of interesting. A lot of the Hebrew names for books of the Bible are a lot different than the names we know of. Uh, it, 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 we know it as Leviticus, um, and what that means of the Levites that comes to us through Latin and before that through Greek. Uh, it has to do with you know. Uh, religious things in the law, you know, uh, not so much dealing about the land, but religious things. Um, it, but this is a little bit where the name is a little bit misleading because it really doesn't only concern the tribe of Levi. Uh, you know, for those of us who, who already know about the 12 tribes and all these different things, uh, we just assume that it is called Leviticus because it's mainly going to talk about the Levites, but it, it doesn't. Uh, and in fact, the Levites aren't as big of a topic as you would think, considering it's called, uh, you know, uh, Levites. So in the Hebrew, though, the name is not Levites. The name is Vayikra, which basically means and he called, which is probably a little bit more accurate because that's how the book starts. And he called Moses. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it has to do more with what Moses is going to say at Mount Sinai rather than uh the Levites, because it isn't a book about the Levites. It's a book that has stuff about the Levites, but not only about the Levites. Um, so what happens in the book, uh, as I mentioned, they really don't go anywhere in this one. Uh, mo- it, it, it <laughs> the, it, I read a lot of fantasy, and a lot of the reviews people say about f- the fantasy books is, this book didn't ha- what do they say? Uh, it didn't have any, um, I forget, what they have this like, you know, term for it, but where the story doesn't progress. Like at the beginning of the story and the end of the story, the story, the, 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 you're at the same point in the story. Now, that's kind of Levites. Like nothing progresses the Israelites 
closer or farther from the promise. It's just talking about uh, the way they're supposed to live and how they're supposed to honor God and that kind of stuff. Um, most of the laws are given at Mount Sinai. Uh, most of it is ta- most of the laws that that have to do with how they should live is in the book of Le- Leviticus. Um, and whereas Exodus focused more on the initial covenant and tabernacle, Leviticus focuses more on um, the uh, sacrifices, um, and no- Numbers focuses more on the tribes and their placements. Uh, so the main theme of the book of Leviticus is basically holiness. Uh, I mean, you could say that in a couple different ways. You could say it like this. Be holy. That's a way you could say it. Or you could say, uh, God is holy. Either way, uh, the main theme is holiness. So God is holy, therefore we should be holy. Um, Leviticus has a very special point uh, in the Bible because it, the holiness thing is really, I don't know of any other biblical book that is emphasizes holiness uh, to the extent of Leviticus, which is a shame because, like I said, most people kind of just ignore <laughs> Leviticus. Uh, but it does have some very important things to say. So some things to consider about the book itself. First off, the law, although we don't really like reading about it because it c- doesn't really make for real ah, reading, um, it's, it's very unique in, in many ways. And one of the ways that it's very unique is the rights that the law has for not just slaves, but also for women. See, we look at it with our modern eyes and we say, okay, yeah, but... You know, it should be it should match our, our modern idea of, of this or that. And obviously the Bible doesn't condone slavery. The New Testament spends a good deal of its time condemning slavery. But, uh, well, I guess you could say transferring slavery, not necessarily condemning it. We're slaves of Christ. Uh, but um, so in, in the Old Testament law, it's not really focusing on making a perfect utopia. It's focusing on pointing us towards the Christ. It's focusing us on showing us our sinfulness, those kinds of things. Um, which is funny because we still haven't got that. Uh, still haven't got that message. <laughs> we're, we're still trying to prove that we're more righteous enough to not uh, need God. Uh, women is another big thing. Um, really, throughout the Bible, you see women elevated far beyond their um, societal norms, and it's interesting because w- Judaism, as a subjugator of women, wasn't really a thing until about the time of Jesus, a little bit before. And wherever Christianity spread, it actually brought liberty to women, uh, whereas wherever Muslim, uh, Islam spread, it would uh, bring captivity to women. But yet now, when you talk to these people at the colleges, they all, they all talk about it like Christianity is the great enslaver of mankind, and it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, another interesting thing about Leviticus, um, worship of God is associated with treatment of people, which is singular in the ancient world. All, all the other laws had to do with, you know... Uh, well, there's, that's a conversation for another day, but let me just kind of simplify it and not go on a long uh, rabbit trail or whatever and just say that um, the, the, the law of the Bible is more focused on if you want to worship God, you have to treat people right. And that was not something that uh, was common in the ancient world. So uh, another thing about Leviticus um, is you see a very important thing. There is an inability from God's people, an inability to manipulate God through sacrifices. This doesn't sound, you know, ooh, to us, but in the ancient world, this is extremely a big point here. Um, they would do certain things, and the gods would be obligated to answer them in a certain way. They would do certain things, and the gods would just have to, you know, do this or have to do this. Um, it, but in the law, you see more like this. Look, I'm God, I'm holy. Therefore, you have to change how you're living. And that doesn't manipulate me. But I will bless you when you obey me, and it's like a, it's a whole different, whole different thing that's going on there. Um, very, very interesting things. Uh, another thing about the law, besides the inability to manipulate God, is the idea that in the ancient world, a lot of their religious uh, practices were focused on getting kind of readings of the future, like uh, the, in their sacrifices, they look at liver spots and these kinds of different things, and that would help them to. Um, you know, find out what the gods are going to do in the future. Uh, they would look to see what animals were migrating at certain times of the years, all these different things, and that would kind of help them to see whether the crops are going to be good, you know, all these different things. But in the law, you don't see that. In, in the biblical law, you don't see that. You don't see, them, oh, and do this, and if God answers like this, it means this, and no. Another thing is uh, cult prostitutes, which were very common in the ancient world, um, are actually completely forbidden in the law, which doesn't surprise us as Christians, but in the ancient world, this was huge, uh, because, you know, the, you would go to the temple, and you would sleep with the priests and priestesses, priestesses, 
<laughs> you would you would literally go there and do this thing, and that would guarantee your uh, your fertility, not just with your spouse, but also with your crops and all kinds of different stuff. But in the law, it's totally different, totally different, and a huge, huge change of um, focus. Um, another thing that that, that's, that sets the law apart that we don't really pay attention to uh, in our modern world is the sacrifices of the law are tied to Israel's covenant with their God. So this whole idea of a covenant where a God, be it whichever God, makes a covenant with the people, and then their sacrifices are tied into that covenant, that is a singular idea. And that's one that is only found uh, in the biblical law. So that takes us to the idea of holiness itself. Uh, sometimes people use words, and I think it's absolutely important to, to be clear on what the words mean. Uh, because some cults can get going, or people can just kind of come to their conclusions. So I'm just going to, real quick, if you already know what holiness means, great for you. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Holiness is two parts. There's holiness on our part. On our part, holiness is a dedication to something for a specific use. So for us, we're, we're holy to God, and that we're dedicated to use for God. Uh, but on God's part, uh, holiness doesn't necessarily mean a dedication on God's part, although he is dedicated to us. Um, it, it's more of the idea of moral purity, that God is incapable of uh, doing wrong. So that would be uh, holiness on God's part. Um, some very important things that, that are still, uh, you know, big points in modern Christianity that I feel like were already resolved in the book of Leviticus. We are born sinful. This is a very important point uh, that a lot of, the, there's a whole new Christian movement that calls itself Christian that uh, all but excludes the possibility of sin in our life. And I just don't understand how it's getting so much momentum. Uh, because, I mean, all the way back at the beginning, you see this theme that we are sinful, we are sinners. Um, we might uh, struggle with certain sins. Let me say, let me, I'm, I'm going to tread this carefully, okay? Uh, we all struggle with certain sins in our lives. Okay, such as sexual sins, okay? But here's the thing. That doesn't make it okay. We live in a culture nowadays that says something like this. I was born like this, therefore it's okay. And I'm going to agree with you. Yes, we are born sinners. We are born in sin. That doesn't make it okay, though. Do you know what I mean? Uh, each of us have our own struggles with sin. You know, well, I'm not going to pry in your life, and you, you, you know what I'm talking about there. Um, and uh, the idea, though, is that we live by God's standards and not our standards. You hear uh, people say this a lot. Why would God make me like this if he wanted me to change? And I'm going to get to that in a second, but just let me just throw this out there. Uh, certain sexual sins, such as homosexuality is the big one now, or you know, transgenderism and adultery and porn and all those, they're all wrong. You know, we, can, we, can, we didn't have to argue the point. We knew that sleeping with somebody else's wife was a sin. And we can even still say that, hey, don't cheat on your wife. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. And don't get in a homosexual relationship. Oh, now you've gone too far. It's like, well, <laughs> well, now hold on, though. Um, you know, what makes it not, what makes it okay now? And the idea is that basically I'm my own uh, compass, and so I think that it's okay now, so now it's okay. But in Leviticus, we see it, there's not this idea of you say what is right and wrong. God says what is right and wrong, and you have to change. So that means, yes, okay, whatever, you're born in sin, great. That doesn't excuse it. That doesn't excuse it. Um, so God does make, did make us, he does love, love us for who we are, but here's the thing that I think is thrown out that Leviticus really draws out. God accepts us as we are, but he doesn't leave us there, right? He accepted them in Exodus when they were still in captivity. But then he brought them out, and before they left, he said, now hold on, hold on. This is the Passover, it's looking forward, okay. So then they get to the, they get to the wilderness, and say, okay, now hold on. Hold on. Here, we're going to do this covenant. We're going to change how things are going. We're going to build this tabernacle. Things are going to be changing. Hold on. This is not, we're not going to do this. So we get into Levit Leviticus, and he says, okay, now these are the things I'm talking about. No more of this pagan nonsense. No more of this pagan nonsense. No more of this. And now all of a sudden, it's, well, hold on. So we get to Numbers, and there's like this mass riot because no, none of Israel wants to follow these laws. Um, so, yes, God does accept us as we are, but he doesn't leave us there. He created us absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, even though we can't be perfect, we must still abandon sin. So even though God did make the children of Israel, he did still set regulations of this is how you have to change. 
Okay, so how can God possibly make us and then not love us for who we are? And I would I would say that that is a gross misrepresentation. Who what we do is not who we are. I, I think that's a big important thing that Leviticus shows us. You are made in the image of God, but then you can also be a son of God by adoption. And this is this is one of the big things that the book of the law is introducing. Now, the, we know that, that verbiage, that, that uh, grammatical con- construct, we know that from the New Testament. But these so- thoughts are being established in the Old Testament. And if it wasn't for the Old Testament, the New Testament wouldn't have had anything to refer back to. See, a lot of what the New Testament is talking about is a reference to the Old Testament. But once again, the law is lost on, on a, lot of, a lot of the modern audi- audience. <coughs> So this doesn't mean that we sh- being made like this, being being in sin, being born in sin, doesn't mean we shouldn't grow and change. That's just called being toxic, right? So I was born a certain way, and then I change as I grow and mature. Now I wash my own body. When I was a baby, my mom did it. Well, I was born that way. Well, yes, but now I've grown and matured, so it's time for me to change. And that's kind of an idea here. Um, this whole idea that everybody should work around me because I was born this way, so therefore it's right. That's just a toxic idea. It doesn't work for any area of your life. Why would it possibly work for what is moral and what is not moral? And uh, so Leviticus does talk about some things that are considered outda- outdated and old-fashioned, such as homosexuality. But I don't really think, as I've just mentioned, that it's something that is a problem with the Old Testament text. I think it's a problem with our modern-day uh, uh, ideas. And uh, so when we're looking at Leviticus, it's important to remember these are not laws that we are still held to. These are, this is the law that the Jews were held to, we are free from it. So when you read the Leviticus, Leviticus, don't try to just apply it all to your life. That's not going to work. Jesus freed us from the law. Okay? But the principles of it you can still learn from. And I hope one day to teach a lot more on Leviticus to just kind of help release some of the mystery to it. Um, so anyways, sin isn't what we choose or are bothered by. It's what God says it is. And that's a whole different um, outline. Than, or I mean not outline, but a whole different idea than we are told in, in society today. As far as the book of Leviticus, I've always tried to give you guys breakdowns that are very simple. So I, I'm, I'm trying to continue that with this. Chapters 1 through 7 are talking about the offerings, the sacrifices that, that are made. Okay, there's different kinds of sacrifices, different reasons and whatnot. So then you get to chapters 8 through 16, and that talks primarily about the priests, which would be the Levites, uh, and the worshipers themselves not just the Levites. So see, when you when you take the book as a whole, calling it of the Levites just doesn't really make much sense. And then you get to chapter 17, all the way to the end of the book, at chapter 27, and this is called the Holiness Code. This is how you should live. And the interesting thing is, it's not how you should act in the, in the tabernacle, it's how you should live. How the Israelites are set apart and living in contrast to how the pagans of the world around them are living. So, so what? What, is, what, uh, what does it matter that, that Leviticus is, is a part of the Bible? And I would say a couple things. First off, I think it shows us God is holy and pure in possibly one of the most direct ways that any other, other book of the Bible does. Um, second off, uh, which, by the way, we often forget that God is holy, especially in our culture. Second off, he's not okay with sin, which is another thing that we can get off base. And not just people in the world, people in the, in the church, too. So we get saved and we realize we need to change. But then after a while we do this thing, we just kind of get, eh, and we stop growing. And, you know, the whole time God's still not okay with our sin, but we excuse those sins because they're commonly accepted sins in the church. Like I mentioned a hundred times, gossip and, and backbiting, those kinds of things. They're still sin, it's just that they're accepted in church culture. Um, and, and so Leviticus so shows us, no, God is not okay with sin. Just because, because we struggle with sin, doesn't mean that God does or should compromise his character, his whole and pure uh, character. We should be holy as he is holy. And that takes us to the book of Numbers. But before we get going, uh, any questions on Leviticus right quick? No? We're good? Okay. Now, that's the driest book of the Bible. So you can get through that one. You're golden. Uh, (laughs) Never mind. I'll keep that joke to myself. Uh, num- the book of Numbers is, is the fourth, and, and we're almost to the end of the books of the law. Um, Numbers is, is kind of like the great divide 
in, in the books of the law. You've got Deuteronomy, which, which is right at the end of Moses' life before Israel goes into the promised land. And you've got Leviticus when they're still at Mount Sinai. But Numbers kind of is this in-between thing. They leave Mount Sinai, and they get to the promised land, but then they give up the promised land, and they go back to the desert, desert and then they get back to the promised land. So it's kind of like this bridging book in between of what, what's all happening, tying the two generations together um, from the Exodus generation to their kids. And uh, so it, it really skips over a lot of 40 years in the wilderness, um, with some of it being at the border. Um, and there's some waiting at the border, which is when Deuteronomy comes into play. Um, it's often thought of as without a theme because it's such a diverse book. You read Numbers, and it starts out with a census, and then it goes to some other laws, and then you get to some stories, and then some laws, and then some stories, and then some laws, and, then, and you keep going back and forth, and you're thinking the whole time, why don't you just make up your mind? If, is this a book about laws, or is this a book about traveling in the desert? What is this book about? And uh, so for a, lot of, uh, for, a lot of, for a long time, people looked at Numbers like it was just a hodgepodge, like just things thrown in there. Um, and it's not. Uh, so we get our name for the book, Numbers, from the Greek Old Testament. I mentioned before it's called the Septuagint. That is the Old Testament that Jesus would have read. It, it was in Greek, uh, which was the common language of the time. And uh, uh, the reason why it's called Numbers is because of the census that is at the beginning and then uh, twenty chapter 20, like 6 or something like that. Um, let me just double check one thing real quick. Okay, uh, but that's not the name. <laughs> Once again, that is not the name of the book in Hebrew. Uh, the name of the book in Hebrew is Bimidbar, which is which means in the desert, uh, which I think is a lot more of an accurate name and really a better name because not only are they in the desert wanderings, which is very descriptive, but they're also in the desert of their own spiritual growth. They're just in this place of, of give and take and not really going anywhere. And for every step forward, they take two steps backwards and it's just... Everything just seems to be falling apart in the desert, and you're, you're, you're left wondering. As, as you go through it, it pretend like you don't have any knowledge of the rest of the story. So you're going through the story, and you're even thinking, are they going to make it? Are they going to get to the promised land before God wipes them out? How many can possibly be left from this great tragedy? Uh, you know, everybody's losing their kids and their husbands, and it's just, it's just terrible. Uh, and then you get to the end, and yes, the promise has endured. The people are still alive, and they, they're, they're, they're still at the border waiting to go in. And uh, which, I mean, we've all been there. You know, you can get stuck in El Paso for, for really hours. <laughs> so what happens in the book? That's the thing. A lot of stuff happens in the book, which is, which is, 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 is fun because people who, who travel through Leviticus, they, they get through, you know, they get to Numbers, and they think, okay, this is going to be a fresh start. But they have to get halfway through the book before they get to actually anything happening, happening. Uh, and then they get into the stories and like, hey, these are some good stories. And then it's broken up by law. And they're like, no, it's going back to the law. Oh, wait, no, it's a story again. Oh, no, it's a law. Oh, no, it's a story again. Uh, you know, and it kind of weighs you down. But if you get the overrunning theme through it, you understand that. Now, here's the thing, okay? The laws that are in the middle of numbers are placed there because they build on the story. This is incredibly important to understanding numbers. When you're reading through numbers, you get through the, through the stuff at the beginning Pay attention to the fact that you're no longer in Leviticus. This is not in Leviticus. This is in Numbers. Pay attention to that. And then the book ends with almost, well, a lot, of, a lot of comparison between the beginning of the book and the end of the book. Pay attention to that. And then you get to these stories, which are not just thrown in there. They're very important stories for the rest of the book, not just for the Bible, but for the rest of the book. Remember, Numbers is its own book. And then in those stories are laws that are placed there because they further elaborate on the story itself. So when you're reading through Numbers, really pay attention to those laws. And I know it's hard to say, really, pay attention to those laws seriously. But I'm seriously saying, really pay attention to those laws. Um, so as far as what happens in the book, there, like I mentioned, there's a census, some laws, rebellion in the desert, uh, another census, and then more laws. And that's, that, that's a good summary of what happens. Um, th this story does not really progress the children of Israel forward too far. Uh, you've been waiting for this grand reveal from Genesis, and you finally get there, and then they don't get there. <laughs> so then you think, okay, it's okay. We'll get, we'll get this in Deuteronomy. The next one, they'll get there. Then you get there, and they don't. I mean, they're just sitting outside talking about <laughs> what's going to happen when they get there. Uh, and so then Joshua is when we actually see those things happen. But if you go to it pretending like you've never read it, 
you're left with a lot of waiting, which is, I think, a very important lesson for us that God is not quite as... It has to happen right now as, as we uh, typically are, which kind of drives me insane. I wish God had my time frame, but he doesn't. Um, so might as well get used to waiting. Uh, the main theme of numbers... Now, I, I'm going to have to say a couple different things. I put on the screen holy versus profane because it really does... Co- it is a book of contrasts. Hey... These are the blessings that are going to come. You're, this is the land that you're going to get. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to slaughter all of you in these stories. They, it's just a bunch of stories about death and destruction. And then, so here's all the people that are, that are your kids, and this is the land that I'm going to bring them to. And it's like, well, hold on. <laughs> What's going on there? Uh, but there is a theme. Uh, it's contrasting the holiness versus the profane. Another way you could say that is contrasting the blessings of God with the curses of God, especially in contrast to the curses of God on Egypt and Exodus. And then you get to Numbers, and you see the curses of God, not on Egypt, but on Israel, uh, which is a big warning to the church, obviously, because, you know, we're not beyond that. Uh, there's kind of sometimes this idea of, well, we're not sinners like the world. Oh, but you can be. <laughs> uh, so there's blessing versus curses. Um, another thing, it could be, a, it could be considered, a, a, the main thing could be a warning book, which I think is very important because there's really only two books in all of the Bible that really talk to old, older believers that not not age wise. I'm talking about how long you've been saved. You can be 90 and not be an old believer. I'm talking about somebody who's who's been saved and matured in, in the church. Okay, uh, I, I think ha- there's only really two books of the Bible that have strong warnings for 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 believers who've been a believer a long time and just kind of drifted off. And those two books are without a doubt in the Old Testament, Numbers, in the New Testament. Hebrews, without a doubt, just without a doubt. You see the you see a lot of the same things happening. And surprise, surprise, Hebrews actually quotes Numbers uh, quite a bit. So <laughs> there is that. Um, and maybe another way you could give the main theme of the book is endings and beginnings, especially the generations, because it starts out with the end of the Exodus generation, and then it, it ends with the beginning of the new generation. So it's kind of a, a book of change. Um, it's, it's kind of in the middle, um, but... It, Here's the thing that so you have I know I, I know I mentioned this it begins and ends with the censuses and the censuses census I censuses with that the counting of the people and with the laws and then in the middle is some stories and some laws in the middle of those stories and laws is really the main theme of the book it's about numbers 15 or so uh, and it it, it 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 basically says this the difference between accidental versus intentional sin right in the middle of these stories. And why is this important? Well, you, he just gives you all these stories of the rebellions and, the, and Korah's rebellion and, and the rebellion at the Promised Land and the rebellion over here and, uh, you know, all these different people rebelling over and over and over. And then right in the middle of that is the law about sacri- offering sacrifices for sin that's intentional versus, uh, is called, intentional sin is called high-handed sin uh, versus uh, accidental sin. And there is a big difference. And there's a big difference today, too. Oh, I'm going to do it anyways, and God will just forgive me for it. Oh, it's okay. I'm just going to keep on doing this. I know it's wrong, but I can just do whatever I want. And, you know, same thing. So some things about uh, numbers that are interesting to consider. I think I, I think I think I have five things. First off, Numbers and Hebrews are, the, I already mentioned this, are the two best books for older Christians, not older people, older, older Christians, uh, who have stopped growing, really more so than a lot of other books. You can go to some books of the Bible, and it's great for if you're new to Christianity. And then there's a lot of in-between books that, that are, you know, great for really anywhere in your Christian walk. But then there are some that are specifically not to young Christians, but specifically to older Christians. And Leviticus and Hebrews is really, I'm sorry, Leviticus and, and uh, Numbers and Hebrews really b- both just click that right there on the head. Um, like the book of 1 Corinthians is a great book for churches that don't have a whole lot of order and are gotten too far into the charismatic thing without keeping it on track with what they believe and what they're doing and that kind of stuff. First Corinthians is a book that really reels them in. Uh, but then there's other books that, that goes the other way. So anyways, moving on. Uh, the same thing to consider about Numbers. Um, there is a huge debate in the book of Numbers because of the numbers of the Israelites. And I'm going to just present that to you. You do with it whatever you will, okay? Uh, first off, if you read the Numbers according to your English Bible, your, 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 how you would probably read it, obviously. I'm assuming none of you know Hebrew. If you do, oh, don't talk to me about Hebrew. <laughs> that language just irritates me to no end. But anyways, 
it makes sense. I just don't like it. I like Greek, but Hebrew just is a... Anyways, I'll struggle with that probably till the day I, the day I die. I might have to hire somebody. And say, Can you explain this to me? Uh, but anyways, um, I- as you read it, you're probably going to be left with the same problem that most modern people and people in the modern audience are. And that's that, that if you take those numbers for how they're written, that would mean Israel is more numerous than Egypt. Israel, there's more Israelites than there are Canaanites. What on earth were they scared about? And then you get to a part, uh, to p- some parts of the law that just doesn't make sense. God says this. This is literally God's word. He says, I picked you not because you were the best, but you were the smallest nation on the world. Why on earth would he say that if they outnumbered uh, Egypt? Why on earth would he say that if they outnumbered Canaan? Like, why would he say that? So you left with a little bit of a problem. And so obviously it goes one of two ways. The numbers are right. It's just our understanding that needs to change. That's Group A, group two, group B would be um, the numbers are wrong. And so the why would the numbers be wrong? This is a quick rundown of why the numbers would be wrong. And like I said, you guys go to whichever side of the argument you want to be at. I really, uh, I, I don't have enough time to uh, try to get everybody to get on my uh, train. Um, the, the issue revolves around a Hebrew word, which is elaf. And the question is, should Elef be translated as thousand or not? And that's the entire argument. So uh, there's a lot more to it. Um, Humphreys argues that the, m- the, enti- the total of the entire nation of Israel at this time is about 20,000. Fighting men and non-fighting men. Um, Mendenhall follows that same pattern. Uh, Kitchen does too. But then a lot of the more conservative guys are going to stick with the older numbers, even though they're so drastically um, inflated and uh, just kind of make their own piece somewhere else. Whichever side of the argument you go on, you're going to have to address this issue of how is there not a contradiction, Wh- which again, everybody lands on it differently, uh, which is why I'm staying out of it. You land whichever way you want. Um, historically, though, it would fit if there was a population of 20,000, and you have a lot of problems trying to make a population of over 2 million fit in the promised land at that time. There's just not enough um, archaeological evidence, historical evidence. I, you really have a lot of problems. Now, you can do it. You can do it. And I, once again, you, you, you can totally do it. There's some great guys that can point you in the right direction. Um, but it is, it is something that you will probably have people bring up if you get into discussions about the Bible. So I'm just trying to let you be aware of it. Um, yeah. So, okay. Uh, the third thing that to consider about the book of Numbers is the arrangement of the camp. This is very interesting, uh, which, once again, I'm, I'm trying not to go long, so we're not going to really get into this. Uh, but uh, basically, they have the tribes around by threes. Three, six, nine, twelve. Yeah, I did that right. By threes around uh, the tabernacle in the center, and God is the one who's at the center, which is, is a way of he's dwelling in their midst. Uh, when w- A lot of times the poetical language in the Bible is actually based off a historical fact. You know, God is dwelling in our midst, literally in the middle of the tabernacles. Or when it says, he who is enthroned on the cherubim, that's because on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was the cherubim, and God would speak from the tar- top of the cov- Ark of the Covenant. So he was literally enthroned on the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so then the fourth thing to, uh, one, two, three, four. Fourth interesting thing about numbers to consider is um, uh, the issue of how these documents, the books of the law, were created because slaves would not have been likely to produce such written documents, which is a fair point, except when you consider the, the, the point that, that, that Moses grew up in Pharaoh's household, so he would have had some sort of education, probably, and that would fit. That would fit. Uh, if, if the Bible was making the claim that every single slave was, was educated, obviously that would be kind of silly, but it doesn't make that claim. It, it says that Moses grew up in the household of Pharaoh, so there, there is a difference there. Um, so then the fifth thing to consider about numbers, uh, number is, is used, in, and some of the other bits of the law, is used in the New Testament um, as warning. You see this, uh, for instance, in 1 Corinthians where it says, don't do like they did here. <laughs> it actually says that in 1 Corinthians. Don't do like the Israelites did here when they did this. Um, but it's also, y- numbers is also used in the New Testament as a way of uh, instruction. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Galatians kind of uses it like that, and uh, Hebrews uses it a little bit like that. The idea of instructional, using it as instructional is this. Um, this was to show us the faults of the law. 
and there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a problem that I think we understand. In the poetical books, it talks about the law being perfect. And in our heads, that's gotten it where that it's talking about the quality of the law. And that's not what it's talking about. The law is perfect in that it is a perfect representation of God's holiness and character. But the law is not perfect in that it's impossible for us to follow. It's not how things should be done on earth. It's just showing sin. Okay, In the new heavens and the new, and the new earth, we're not going to be living like they would have supposed to have been lived in the books of the law. So there's different things like that, but I'm not going to weigh you down too much with that. I just want to point you to that and have a good time studying. Um, so then the outline of the book, once again, I've really tried to focus on keeping these things narrow. And so because of that, you're going to have a little bit of um, some groups that I've broken it down into kind of filter into other areas. Okay, So by and large, you can break numbers down into chapters 1 through 10. 11 through 25, and 26 through 36. So the first 10 chapters and the last 10 chapters, and then everything in the middle. So the first 10 chapters are legal issues. They talk about the population, settling, various laws. Um, and this is the last generation being prepared. You guys are getting ready to go. Get ready. And then you get to the in-between chapters, chapters 11 through 25. This is more of struggling with sin. Okay? So... Uh, the legal issues that appear in between the stories are more for applicational uses, not just to throw out laws for no reason. Um, and this is where the last generation gives up their inheritance. So there right there you have the the book as we would write it. That's how we would end it. Yep, they had this promise and they lost out on it. The end. But that's not where number that's typically not where God leaves it at. We get to the last ten chapters of the book, which takes us back to the legal issues. And this is, you know, population and settling and all that stuff. And the next generation is being prepared. So just as it started with the last generation being prepared, it ends with the next generation being prepared. And then that takes us straight into the book of Deuteronomy where he's getting ready to die, Moses that is, and uh, the people of Israel are uh, really just kind of waiting it out <laughs> before they go. <laughs> they, they're they're kind of stuck because everybody from the last generation has died, uh, but they can't go yet because Moses isn't allowed in. Uh, and so they got like this awkward... You know, it's like it's like you know that awkward stage you go through in life. You know, uh, y there's a part where you're dying, and then there's a part where you're born. But everything in between is this awkward part where you don't have it all figured out, and you're just trying to stumble your way through life as best as you can. But everybody expects you to because you're the adult. You know, it's kind of like that. Uh, but so so what? What does numbers really have to give us today? Why does it matter that's in the Bible? And I would say so much. Without the warnings of numbers there would be a very lopsided view of God. There would be a lopsided view of grace. There would be a lopsided view of, of growth and what it means to continue to grow as a Christian. There'd be a, the, a lot of these things we'd miss out on, but Numbers gives us a lot of depth to these things that oftentimes are not really talked about. I mean, think about how many pastors you've heard, besides myself, who take substantial sermon time to talk about how we as Christians need to keep on growing. You don't hear it a whole lot. It's not a very commonly, you know, people don't talk about it a whole lot. They talk about the evils of the culture, okay. They talk about how to get saved, okay. And then they talk about, like, you know, surface things, like uh, how to grow your faith. But not really anything that really gets to the heart and character of you. See what I mean? And, and, and Numbers gives us a little bit of a deeper look at ourselves than we like to take all by ourselves. Because typically we like to stay on the surface of things. So um, as it is, uh, it stand, the, the book of Numbers, that is, stands as a great instruction and encouragement for continued growth. Regardless of whether you're in a place of bitterness or not, Numbers is a great place to point you to growth. So in Leviticus and Numbers, when we take these two most hated books of the Bible side by side, I think we have some very important things. First off, Leviticus teaches us to stay separate from the world, how they do things. Not separate from the world like we shouldn't go out and talk to people. I mean, uh, our lifestyle different from the world, okay? That's kind of Leviticus' whole main purpose. But the numbers isn't really focused on the world getting in. The focus on numbers is kind of separates the healthy growth from the unhealthy growth. Or if you want to say it a little bit more severe and harsh, uh, in the book of Numbers, it separates God's true people from God's fake people. So whereas Leviticus separated God's people from the world, from the sin, sinners, <laughs> you don't live like them. Numbers kind of does that exact same thing, but saying instead of don't live like them, the world, 
don't live like them, the people in the church who are causing problems. And this is a very important message because a lot of times people will say something along the lines of this. I don't go to church anymore because I, there are a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, my feelings were hurt. You know, people betrayed me, those kinds of things. Well, those things are ever going to happen everywhere. But, uh, you know, Jesus was also betrayed by those same people. <laughs> and Numbers also is written to those same kinds of people. And so you see this kind of rec recurring thing, and it's just very important book of the Bible, extremely important book of the Bible. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, Numbers is, is, if you could just take all the interesting parts and make one shorter book, I think people, <laughs> I joke, I kid. Are there any questions about Numbers? We're, we're, we're going to stop there. And since how I started late because I was having computer problems, we're right at 30 minutes, guys. We've done it. <laughs> We've done the impossible. <laughs> Tell your friends. I didn't go an hour. <laughs> but anyways, uh, any other questions about numbers? We're good? Okay. Uh, if, if I went over anything too too fast, you can always put it in the question box for one of the Wednesdays. That's one thing. Also, we have it recorded on Facebook. You can go back and rewatch it. So there are options. You have nothing but options at your fingertips. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, for just the ability for us to understand an intelligent God. Um, you know, that, that, that you're not just some being out there that we have to stumble our way for, but you are an intelligent being. The creator is an intelligent being who's able to communicate with us in a way that we are able to understand and appreciate. And we thank you, Lord, because without that, we would be left on our own to figure it out. But you haven't left us on our own. You have reached down to meet us and take us forward. Lord, we thank you for your word, Leviticus and Numbers, that it shows us how to live holy and how to continue to grow as Christians and as believers. Uh, I pray that you'd bless those who are reading through the Bible, help them to stay in it and to, to learn from it, show them things that they've never seen before, God. Uh, and as they're, as they're reading it, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, read apart and just kind of get bored with it, but you'd show them fresh, fresh things from your word because your word is uh, obviously still living and active uh, in every way. We thank you, Lord. Amen.